Is investment something that's always been on your mind, but you don't quite know how to get started on that journey? We are here to set you on the right course. Welcome to My Cash Flow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We are all about getting out of the rat race through creating positive passive income through real estate investing. Here you'll hear from regular people just like you and the professionals who support us towards greater wealth. Learn before you earn, move from analysis to action, and find the right path to attaining the success that you've always dreamed of for yourself. Now, here's your host, Athena. Welcome to My Cash Flow Academy's podcast, where we introduce you to people who have gotten out of the rat race, become financially free, and the businesses that help them expand their wealth. At times, though, we do make it a point to interview nonprofits that are in the affordable housing, shelter space, and businesses that support them. So today, I'm really excited to introduce you to a mover and shaker in the affordable housing and buyer education, home buyer education space, Alicia Metricardi. Hopefully, I got that right. You did. Thank and the you, JD. Yeah. I always love saying the JD because that's hard Me earned. Too. Yes. Yeah. So Alicia is a general counsel and director of real estate for new economics for women. Right. So welcome to our podcast, Thank Alicia. You, so much for you go by Allie or Alicia? What Allie do you prefer? Allie's fine. Allie's fine. It's a little friends. easier on my tongue, you know. Okay. So I'd love for you to share your story, the steps that led you to this very exciting kind of place that you're in where you can make such a change here in Los Angeles and actually other places too, right? You could share with us. I'm sure it's a challenging position, but you're an attorney, so I'm sure <laughs> you're handling it. So welcome and, and uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Athena. Likewise. I'm yeah. Honored. Yeah. Um, this is very cool. So, so tell us a little bit about you. Like who's Allie and where'd you grow up? And Sure. I'm an Angelino. Our offices are here I was just noting that I can see Elysian Field, Dodger Stadium from my office window here. Today. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, so New Economics for Women is a nonprofit that has been in operation for, I want to say 30 years now, um, wow. building affordable housing and looking at how to move families into economic stability. So mm. we pride ourselves on building economic mobility. And we do that through programs, services, and affordable housing. Mm. offerings that help families to realize their own potential. Mm. Um, we don't prescribe what economic mobility or what success means for a family. They tell us what their vision is and we help to enable that. So we have families that are have an entrepreneurial spirit and we have other families that need more basic stability that come from situations of domestic violence or homelessness. So it really runs quite the gamut as to where we meet our clients and where they need to go. So we help to give them the strength of mind and confidence and resources mm -hmm. to be able to articulate what their next level would be. So for a lot of families, we tend to focus um, our marketing activities on single parent families or female okay. headed households, but we serve everyone and we've been doing so for the past 30 years. Do you know how that all started? Do you know the story of how the I founder do. kind of, I do. how it germinated? Uh -huh. Yeah. So it was a group of women. They were Latinas who were together. They came together after a meeting with a group called Comisión Femenil de Los Ángeles. So that okay. was the women's rights Latina activist kind of chain oh, wow. of Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Um, and they were looking at how their families overcame poverty. All of them resoundingly having come from situations of poverty and now being able to articulate, you know, with undergrad and master's degrees and run these incredible careers, what made them the outliers and why, mm -hmm. why should they be outliers? Mm -hmm. And what they found was that it was the ability for someone in their family somehow along the way to be touched by an influence that allowed them to break out of a mindset and allowed them resources as well, because it's not just the change of mindset, but do you have access? If your family mm -hmm. doesn't come from money, do you have access to be able to get an education, further yourself, access to childcare? That was a big issue mm -hmm. in terms of how to advance economic mobility. And so the organization was founded by a group of these feisty women mm -hmm. who said, we need to break poverty for families. And we're going to be the ones who initiate that. And hopefully we can spread it as a movement and take it across the country. And wow. To date, so that was their vision, right? That was their vision, and they continue to work on it. So one of mm -hmm. our founders continues to be very active with the board. 
Wow. And we have other friends along the way and board members along the way and staff that have all bought into the idea that we can help to build a pipeline of economic mobility for a family. Mm -hmm. And that's a little different than the affordable housing industry, which right. as an industry where, and we need so many more participants in the industry, but the industry is not necessarily geared towards ending poverty. It's geared right. towards stability. Mm -hmm. And so to end poverty, generational poverty for a family, mm -hmm. you have to equip the whole family with the mindset to get there. So the kids mm -hmm. have to be on board, right? The mm -hmm. kids can't right. be crazy spenders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the parents right. are now trying to get them into a new place or a new economic dynamic. Even the children we've found need to be sensitized to why they're not getting $300 sneakers. The extended family, the grandparent generation, the aunts and uncles, it helps them to get on board so that yeah. they don't feel isolated, that there's certain family members that are moving out of sync with the rest of the family. Right. Um, and oh, these, interesting. Are all, these are all lessons over time, but we try to work on what we call whole family transformation. Mm. Where we're addressing what are the needs of a senior population versus the needs of a working parent of child rearing age yeah. uh, or a parent who has teens and needs access yeah. to some different resources versus the children and trying to meet children where they're at as well. Mm. So it's a fun organization tour. Wow. It's been amazing. So since their founding, how many, I don't know if you count by rooms in your business or oh, yeah, by absolutely. beds, I, you yes. know, student housing's beds. So yes. how do you count? Apartments. Okay. Yeah. So we have oh, given in our portfolio and with partnerships, I think the total figure is about 1,300 apartments throughout uh -huh. the city of Los Angeles. Oh, wow. We recently um, sold off. We acquired rehabbed and sold a property in Denver. And that okay. was almost 300 units in one facility. So that was mm -hmm. our biggest at one point. Yeah. Um, wow. Project. So we've taken partnerships, we've acquired and sold along the way, but affordable housing for new economics as a participant in the affordable housing industry mm. is a long-term hold because okay. we're looking at not only addressing the safe space for a family to live, Mm -hmm. uh, ensuring that affordability for the next 30 years, you know, right. and making sure that we can hedge bets against, we tend to be the first to the table in underinvested communities. Mm -hmm. But when you make that investment, you change the level of the value of the real estate, right? How do you hedge against the inflation of the value and the gentrification of the neighborhood? Uh -huh. You're performing that work that really affects the land value. Right. And so that's why we're yeah, kind of a catch 22 for you guys, huh? It is that works in underinvested areas. How do you try to prevent displacement because mm -hmm. you brought such a quality resource <laughs> right. to the neighborhood, right. right? Whether that's housing or whether that's an economic development center, how do you make sure that the very community that you're trying to benefit doesn't have to go someplace else because now you've raised the land value? Right. Um, of the place that you're affecting. And so mm. that's place That makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. And in, within the industry, that's place-based community development strategies, right? So mm. bearing in mind, not only to make sure that the economic investment can reap an earning, right? For mm -hmm. investors. We're a nonprofit. Right. It's not as important, but mm -hmm. uh, for our investors so that we can stay current on loans. But mm -hmm. we've got to look at the end user and how are we affecting the end user and making that place-based improvement a long-term strategy rather than a short-term mm -hmm. that will lead to their displacement. Really yeah. important, especially here in LA. Yeah, what a tricky thing. Yes, it's a very uh, difficult Delicate balance. Delicate balance. And, yeah. yeah, wow. Yeah. Unless you buy up the whole block, but even still, if you bought up a whole block, you'd still have the other blocks display. I mean, it's a ripple effect, yeah, right? I mean, no matter well, if it's I'm one or 10 properties. Correct. So we economics operates all throughout Los Angeles. I'm speaking to you from what we call our like Pico Union or Westlake headquarters. Mm. This area is under extreme gentrification because we're feeling the brunt of a push to expand downtown LA's corridors mm. in terms of live, work, play. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting a lot more moderate income to high end income housing being built all around us. That means that, give you an example, the property across the street is soon to be developed. 
by a developer that's looking at market rate housing. Um, That's going to eventually mean the displacement of the 22 families across the street. So what do we do? Do we organize them to fight the development? Do we teach them how to maximize their relocation benefit and and perhaps move to an area where their families might be able to thrive a little bit better? I mean, it, it brings up so many values and So if I'm hearing you right, so the building across the street is currently 22 units, but that building's been sold to a developer who's going to like tear it down and build something monstrous at market rate. Okay. So these aren't your people. So this is not your building, but it's people that you would be helping. No. And why? Because they're being displaced. Yeah. Why is it? Right. It's not. And we looked at it and wanted to buy it. So as a nonprofit, we run so many programs that our balance sheet doesn't reflect how robust our real estate portfolio is. And to any and why doesn't it? lender, mm-hmm. you know, the running programs requires fundraising year after year. Our risk kind of ratios are too high. Yeah. So no, we don't qualify for the loans that other groups will qualify for because we're not as well capitalized as private right. developers. So a private developer was able to acquire and they take first position. So mm-hmm. we write, my write-up of an LOI and <laughs> my attempt to buy buildings falls flat often because making sure that we have the resources to compete with market players. I mean, sometimes market players can blow us out of the water. Right. Our product delivery is par and better, if you uh-huh. ask me, in terms yeah. of what the market can bring. But the foot in the door to take seriously an offer from a nonprofit that doesn't have the capitalization of a million or more liquid assets on its balance sheet mm-hmm. can be really difficult. And there's really a very few in LA that have that. And so this is the good work that we try to do every day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so you need a solution to that so that you can play against some of these developers. Yeah. Yeah. Or we need partnerships. Right. Or we I think need the developer to say, work. you guys are a great builder, and I don't want the headache of lease up, and you guys know how to do it. That's really, I think, our next <clears> level <throat> is to look at really innovative partnerships with fantastic mm-hmm. developers. We can fight it all day, and mm-hmm. we can carve out affordable units. Right. And it depends on what the specifics of each deal is. Right. But I'm more inclined to say, let's look for some really wonderful partners. Let's look for some groups that are trying to incorporate as social impact organizations Mm. that want to use opportunity zone funding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Let's see how we can do that rather Mm -hmm. than just become the obstacles to development. That doesn't push you forward when you're just being someone's obstacle, right? It, Is that it, what you're it saying? It bears in a very important role. It's a particularly heated and controversial conversation mm-hmm. uh, because we have to be at the front lines of advocating for our community. What does that advocacy have to look like? For me, it's not always to be the obstacle. It just depends. It's deal to deal. Right, yeah. right. So, and I'm trying to understand this business model. So if you could have beat out that, that builder across the street and built a really nice building, you still wouldn't charge market rents because you're trying to help people afford it, right? right or right. do you help them get Section 8 and try and Either push one. it up as much as you can? Either one. We deliver back results for whomever we're, is our investor or our lender. Mm-hmm. Uh, but would we have the cash flows of a completely market rent building? No. Now, would we have the property tax exemption that this new developer would want? Yes, because there are certain tax exempt property uses that we're able to get if we can okay. get if we can really reduce the cost of the housing and make it more affordable. It, that's where the advantage lies in terms of working with another. Okay. So the cash flow could be a little bit better because in the end too, these buildings need to not only pay the lender or the investor but also have cash flow to support Absolutely. the organization and keep growing, right? Like well, that's the yeah, money pot. It, it really never pencils to support the organization. It, right. It just goes right back into the building's operating expenses right, right. because we have to underwrite the reduction in the rental income. Mm-hmm. So that's right. where our pro formas get a little complicated. Yeah. <laughs> they look a little wonky, as they say. <laughs> a little crazy. Yeah. But oh, that, that's that okay. Fun. I mean, I think the numbers and that those kinds of calculations are really interesting. And they are. the fun part of what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, it, 
breaks up my day to work on some pro formas and then go work on some programs. And then, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah, um, we're in renovation on a building right now. Oh, cool. Uh, and we're in construction on four buildings right now. We are in renovation of a 60 unit property called La Posada. Okay. Transitional housing for single parent women and one child. Okay. Single women. And it people that are homeless or? Formerly homeless. Yeah. Okay. Now they do have to pay rent. Right. Um, and rents are generally $500 a month in the building. Okay. But we provide on site case management services. And, like social uh, services? Case yes. manager. Okay. And it's transitional because it's got a cap of really a two year stay. So okay. this is safe place. No visitors are allowed past the second floor of the building. Mm. Um, we want to make sure that every resident is protected and that her rights are primary. And mm-hmm. we have some restraining orders active right. um, for f- former abusers that have attacked residents who now live in that building. So this is Interesting. Very near and that's near. 60 units. And is it one woman per room? The rooms yes. are... Okay. Yes. One okay. woman and their child up to age 18. The okay. units are small. I mean, it's, oh, I think it's okay. between 250 and 300 square foot. So kind of like a hotel room, small hotel room? It's a room. former SRO. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got so it. We have shared kitchens on each floor and shared laundry facilities. There's common space at the bottom at the ground floor and program uh-huh. offices. And that building is under renovation while it's Mm. fully occupied but a labor of love that's it's going to be a fantastic renovation and we're really proud and honored to work on that Mm -hmm. yeah that is Um, cool so that's one that's renovation so you know rehab we're in new construction on four single family homes that we're actually in escrow right now so we have four purchasers that earn no greater than 120% of area median income. Okay, so, so what's medium? Is it 80 something now, something like that? Or 69? Yeah, like that's for a family of four. I think oh, okay. a single person, it's even less, Okay, if I recall. And I don't know the family sizes of the families that are our buyers, but... And um, where are these homes approximately? Is it like downtown Los Angeles or Los they're Angeles? They're in Canoga Park, so City okay. of LA in, in the Valley. San right, Canada okay. Valley. That is actually our second multi million dollar investment in the past two years in Canoga Park. Wow. And we've got a 15 year history of investing. I want to say the total figure is $15 million into Canoga. Wow. Um, as just as an example, right? Yeah, right. Um, so that when we first acquired uh, land to build was 15 years ago, it was a former DWP site, five acres, and New Economics spearheaded the creation of a charter school affordable housing wow. community center in that acreage. acreage. Wow. Yeah. And that's so pretty that's, cool. Yeah. 115 units of affordable is Tierra del Sol so, mm-hmm. um, fully 100% affordable housing project. So every renter in that building is meets a criteria to be able to apply and earn a space in that building for affordability purposes. Uh-huh. And then our charter school partner occupies the charter school Actually, I think it's uh, owned now by LAUSD and leased back to us as the, okay. or back to our partner. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the Dennis Pizine Community Center is a 20,000 square foot building, two stories, where we have our family source center providing programs and opportunities to families in Canoga. Wow. On the bottom floor is our child care, child care development center. It's a child care center. Okay. Wow. In the neighborhood, it's a nonprofit partner. So that's three nonprofits operating on in one space. space. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's fun. That's like that's a successful fun. partnership, right? An example of yes. successful partnership for yes. you guys. And here's another. So uh-huh. where I'm speaking to you from is another example of actually, it's going to be potentially five nonprofits operating out of one building. So oh, I, wow. I, I think our acreage here is 1.25 acres at the corner that I'm speaking to you from. Wow. So we call this building Prosperity Center, and it's New Economics for Women. It's a charter school downstairs from us. Queens Care Health Clinics is our new tenant who's moving in to do primary health care services, and we think they're going to also offer dental services wow. on our ground floor. We just have been working with Five Keys, which does ESL and GED programs for adults. Oh, wow. Um, and they work with recent parolees and have an anti-recidivism program. Uh-huh. Um, so that's wow. really cool. And we're working with a fifth nonprofit. Can't share their name. But uh-huh. a fifth nonprofit who's phenomenal, and hopefully they'll come on board and 
also be able to offer their services here in the building. And so wow. we're really proud of that. Yeah, we're that's really neat. Here. And we like that. So we, this is kind of our model is how can we get groups that share our vision? Let's get families on pathways to economic mobility. Let's yeah. build the middle class mm. out of poverty. And these groups, they get it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we right. work with other groups. That so you don't it. have to explain a lot. Or- yeah. We also work with fantastic for-profits mm. that also get it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't want to leave them out. You know, right. them, the world cannot go around. I, you know, mm-hmm. I fully embrace their participation with us. We have to and we should. Yeah. And I think there's more and more groups that are interested in kind of the triple bottom line, right? Yeah. People, profits, and places. Yeah, for sure. And I love that. That's a big part of who I am as a philosophy. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. so you mentioned the past numbers. Now I was reading somewhere that your goal is to have like 364, I don't know where you got that number, but 364 units built in the next two years. Is that part of your business Actually, plan or two, has that changed? 2,000 units in the next two years. And we're tracking. I mean, that can be from partnerships. That can be from new construction or rehab. So we're tracking. Got a couple of ideas that we're moving on. So deals in the pipeline, as you mm-hmm. said. And it's exciting. Every day we vet new opportunities and partnerships. So yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, and that's only out of my shop, out of the real estate department. What are the other departments that bring new together? So we have an economic mobility department that really looks at home ownership, financial education, debt reduction. It's the backbone of kind of getting into the head of a family as to the financial education component. Then we have a family source centers, which run a number of different projects. There's a housing navigator project that works with everything from families in situational crisis, living in motels. I think the last figure was several hundred families that have been touched by instances of homelessness, Mm. domestic violence, or complete housing instability. And we work with them over the long term. So we try to build relationships with them and place them and then find avenues out of crisis for them. And so that's our program function. So that's a different department as well. We have our learning centers. So we have learning centers that serve, I want to say it's over 100 children every day. Oh, wow. Um, after school activities. So they start oh. at three and they don't end till seven or eight o'clock at night. I forget. So the, the parent time. can come get them kind of like a boys and girls exactly. club or something like that. Exactly. Safe space that really accelerates their learning. And it's not just to do homework. How can we help a family to do homework altogether? How can we yeah. make sure that that parent feels comfortable challenging the teacher at school or participating at school Yeah, um, for them to understand their role? in the relationship for them to feel more confident in terms of being able to read with their kids or do yeah. their science homework. I mean, I've got a little one at home. I cannot imagine doing math or science homework. I know. <laughs> or, a, or a grammar. Oh, know, essay. yeah. It's got to be really daunting. There's like a point where the parent goes, yeah. So we help parents to overcome that gap or mm-hmm. at least like not to fake it. Like, you know, they, maybe they don't know advanced algebra, but how do you serve as a sounding board to your kid? Make sure that they feel comfortable asking questions. They have an environment where they can do their work, where they uh-huh. are not hearing gunshots or yeah. um, being threatened by gang recruiter on the mm-hmm. corner. We need to establish safe spaces. Another mm-hmm. big thing that we're into, just fascinating and heartbreaking at the same time, is we recently were made aware, we did a big community survey in twenty. 17, where we ask children, I mean, I want to say like first through fifth grade, Mm -hmm. to draw what their favorite healthy food was, their favorite place, and where they feel safest. Mm -hmm. And what came out of those conversations was that the little ones, especially the young ladies, Mm -hmm. over and over in un, what is it, that you know when kids hear one another and they replicate the story, instance after instance where they couldn't hear their peers. They said that they were, felt most vulnerable on the street to and from school. Interesting. And walking to and from school let was them scary. feel vulnerable. They, the girls would say, I don't like how I'm talked to, or they try to talk to mommy, or men look at me and they're drunk. It was so heartbreaking. Yeah. So New Economics for Women actually has established as, as one of our central community organizing tenants now. 
that we will go to speak to the most vulnerable voices. Mm -hmm. And those are often the voices of children. And so in our place-based strategy, how do we increase eyes on the street Mm -hmm. and increase the level of responsibility that we take among one another as neighbors to own that our children need safe passage everywhere Mm -hmm. they go. And yeah. it's not okay for women to feel threatened of any right. threatened right. on the street whatsoever. Right. Um, so it's a big deal. And, and how that, do you do that? You make sure that there's other oh people gosh. walking with them or, I mean, how well, do you... it gets do- into everything. It gets yeah. into the, my side. It gets into how do we design the outside of the building? How can we use our resources? Can we share the camera to not only look at our building... Mm-hmm. Can we catch the street too? Yeah. You know, street can we make sure that we have, if we do have security in the building, that they have a very clear, visible view of the entire block, Yeah, right? not just our own building? How yeah. can we use the resources that we have yeah. to engage in a community strategy? And then how can we train people as to what their rights are, who to call? How do mm-hmm. we sensitize LAPD? I mean, I'm using LA as an example, right? Right. But how do we sensitize LAPD as to what, is happening or get their involvement. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's something that we're working on, but Mm. it's a very hot issue for us. Yeah, I bet. um, Is something that is particularly challenging too. How do you solve for the world's ales? Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah, the little neighborhoods, the microcosm of of the bigger issues, right? So it makes sense. If you tackle that, then it becomes an example of what can be done. Well, and that's, so, and that it goes back to us wanting to bring to bear what are the resources that we can bring to an area and let's not stop at just what our work. Let's figure mm-hmm. out who else is doing this work. Who does right. it great? Who is a community organizer that can help us with dealing with that? Who addresses the issues of violence in our streets? Mm-hmm. Where do our young men go? Where's their program? And it brings yeah. up so many dynamics. So Yeah. It's yeah. It, once you start thinking of one aspect, it kind of leads you to the chain, right? So, yeah. That's it. It's very interesting. Do you still have properties in Denver? I, like the vision is to be all over the world or all over the U.S. So <laughs> so do you have just in Los Angeles so right far? Right now it's just Los Angeles. Okay. And where in Los Angeles, without telling the addresses, but no, like no. you mentioned areas. Canoga Park. Yeah. Did I read San Pedro or San yes, Pedro? San Pedro, <laughs> okay. Union, East LA, Glassell Park, just off of okay. the five. We have services in Van Nuys and we're expanding. So we're looking yeah. at different requests. Well, 2,000 units in the next two years. So far, I heard of 60, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, 100, I don't know. Exactly. But that's pretty yeah. cool. So tell us a little bit on the personal side. How did you end up here? So you grew up here. Did your mom look at you and say, one day you'll be a community activist, my little baby? (laughs) She may have, right? (laughs) Actually, she did. (laughs) I grew up in LA. Um, Big family, small family? Small family. My older brother, my younger brother. Okay. parents. My grandmother raised me. Oh, wow. Uh, My parents worked really long hours. So I was with my Mm. grandmother all the time. This is the Puerto Rican side. Mm -hmm. At one point, my mom decided that... I had to do an externship in high school. I went to a very incredible high school, very fancy, okay, all girls school in LA in Hancock Park. And I had to do a community service project. And she decided that I would work at New Economics for Women. Oh my God, you're kidding me. No, and brought me here. La Posada had just opened. That's the transitional housing project for Uh um, young moms. It used to serve teen moms. This is in the 90s. So she said the best way for me to learn abstinence and family planning, go work in an environment of high poverty teens who now have children. Right. And understand how, how my experience was so unique and understand how I was no different. So that's how I started. And that's incredible. yeah, and she wanted. So you're in high be, school, and was that a brief thing, or did you keep coming back? I went every- just one summer. Okay. I left, had an incredible experience here that was very scary because <laughs> those teen moms told me what's what, and I think I was doing organizing with them or helping them with financial literacy stuff. I don't really recall, but mm-hmm. it was an incredible experience, and I learned about New Economics for Women's philosophy around mm-hmm. economic mobility and using housing as a catalyst for social change. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, right? 
So I was yeah. thinking about, I've always kind of wanted to be someone that yapped all day. <laughs> I mean, I read about ancient Greek philosophers and how they would stand on the soapbox and uh -huh. articulate their points. And I thought mm -hmm. if that were a career, that's what I would want to do. It yes. doesn't exist. So I was thinking of the law, <laughs> even very young. And the experience at New Economics sent me off to undergrad thinking that what I'm really interested in is spaces and places. And oh. how do spaces and places interact with people? Uh -huh. uh, I also witnessed the LA rebellion. I call it a rebellion. It was a rebellion, riots rebellion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a period of incredible vulnerability for me and my family. Mm. Uh, to see my own neighborhood set afire was awful. Yeah. Um, and to know what happened that the officers who beat Rodney King to a pulp were also exonerated set me afire as well. Yeah. So that was a horrible three days, four mm -hmm. days. And it made me think about the strength of what does it mean to live in a city? What does it mean to have neighbors? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah. What does it mean to rebuild? And what is resilience? And mm -hmm. so I took all of that and the experience at New Economics for Women, and I went to undergrad, and I did my senior thesis on New Economics for Women's Housing. So housing as, as a catalyst for change. So what was and your bachelor's degree in? I went to UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and I was an American Studies major in okay. urban policy, Okay. and I minored in city planning and public policy. That what a great degree. Kind of it was this rich amalgamation of all of the urban related studies that I could do. <laughs> yeah, that's um, awesome. It was cool. And it was almost like a pre-law thing. I don't even think that pre-law existed at Berkeley at the time, but it was almost a pre-law thing. But uh -huh. more on the city planning side. And did you come out of there thinking you would want to be a city planner or? City manager. City ma You thought that would city be a manager. good one? I thought that okay. was where it was at to really as city managers, right? City managers have a knowledge of how all of the departments work together to improve city function. Mm -hmm. Loved it, loved the concept. That's what I thought I wanted to be. New Economics heard about my senior thesis, mm. called me up and offered me a job. So oh my instead, gosh. <laughs> of, instead of staying in Oakland, or I was happy as a clam, after graduating and working a little bit up north, I did move back home. And I took a job as a project manager and so began, I think it was a three-year stint at New Economics for Women for the second time. So the project then, manager was at New Economics. Yeah. I was okay. completely underqualified for my position <laughs> and <laughs> working alongside brilliant leadership here. Oh, wow. Brilliant leadership who was churning out affordable housing. Wow. And really, really innovative at the forefront of where affordable housing was growing as a movement. Mm -hmm. This is in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was really excited to do it. I also ran our homeownership programs for a period of years. So I taught mm -hmm. classes in financial literacy and homeownership mm -hmm. in English and in Spanish. And at one point I was managing a staff of six, I believe. So that's a pretty good group. That's a pretty good program to have. Well, and I also have. like wasn't even 23. So yeah. this was... <laughs> Right. This was a lot, but I was loving it. I mean, yeah. it was fascinating. I ended up leaving New Economics only to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And a great story, a beautiful story, our executive director at my going away party, she said, when you become a lawyer, we're going to hire you back as our general counsel. And wow. I thought, oh, how funny. <laughs> yeah, right. Because I thought there's no way that New would have that much business for me to have to handle. And I was thinking first year law students are so full of themselves and I was so full of myself. And I thought I'm going to be writing Supreme court briefs. This is all before this is before law school, you know, and, and tears out your ego, yes. uh, which is, we do that first, which is very helpful. <laughs> um, so I went to law school. I ended up working for various firms and I was working 
And I got into more into transactional real estate again, because I love real estate. I love cities and where's the heartbeat of a city and how does it operate and what is it? Mm. And so I continue to do transactional real estate through my law practice, Mm. law, a broker as well. So I do some brokerage work through a a different um, Mm -hmm. Parthay group. And then new economics called me again. (laughs) So this is their second call. So how many years were you doing this on your own thing before they called two, three years? years. No, I think it was 10 years. And now I need to really gain some good experience. Right. Okay. Make it worthwhile so that I knew what I was talking about when I was talking (laughs) over it. That's helpful. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Or at least I thought I did. I don't know. (laughs) And then I got a call again that they were looking for a director of real estate. Again, phenomenal leadership here, an incredible predecessor to my job, who was wonderful to me. But I wanted to make sure that I stayed in the law because I had worked so hard to build up my own practice. I didn't want to close that down. And I really wanted to continue thinking as a lawyer, I didn't want to just hang that up and go right into real estate. Right. And it has actually been, I think, beneficial because we don't have as much of an outside counsel bill. (laughs) Right. I'm on board, which is wonderful. And so that I think worked for the organization. So I've now been here, I think I'm on my fifth year here as director of real estate and general counsel. And so I wear the two hats. It's not a full-time position for me, but I'm here quite a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And it's been incredible fun and I'm incredibly proud of it. So this is what I do. For me and my personality type, I love switching gears. I love Uh that I'm not exclusively on one project and delivering on one issue. I think it's really fun to get into the weeds on a lot of different issues Mm-hmm. figure out how best my role can be. How can I be most impactful with each project? And when you kind of mentioned earlier that you loved seeing how things come together and a city manager sees yeah. how everything comes together. So I have a feeling that probably that's part of it is you go into several things and because yeah. you can see more and more how they go together and well, that enhances each, each part, and right? I'm totally comfortable with identifying when it's the role is not for me. We need uh-huh. to bring in an expert at a certain area. I mean, especially as affordable housing changes, I can tell you what has been a challenge for new economics for women is we don't do what's called permanent supportive housing. That's housing for homeless with wraparound services. The level of intensity for that housing model Mm. is an incredible level of intensity. The acuity is very high. We tend to serve working families. Mm. There's a different acuity level there in terms of the psychosocial work that has to be done. Mm. Um, And so we've got a learning curve and we're getting there, but making sure that we're all trained up and being able to understand that dynamic and contribute meaningfully for the city Mm. and Mm. the county, that's been a challenge to a lot of nonprofits Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because so few nonprofits were doing homeless housing, I want to say five years ago. And so that's a challenge across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, that we sort of feel. So in your funding, so you mentioned private individuals, private investors, and then you get loans. Do you get uh, city support, or like AAA oh, yeah. support? or yes. So you also have grants of some kind. We have loans at various interest rates from the city with compliance, regulatory compliance, to make sure that we're serving the population that we say we're going to serve. Right. And we can deliver back on those promises. And then mm-hmm. it's typically a forgivable loan after time. Some of them are mm-hmm. not. Some of them are no interest. Some of them run interest like lenders. But I want to say the majority, the bulk of our portfolio has to be at least in some part is touched by public sources. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you do the reporting or you have a financial <clears throat> branch? I do not. Yeah, okay. because it's typically program reporting or oh. resident reporting. So we mm-hmm. have a property management arm that mm-hmm. would do that and then a program mm-hmm. arm do that, collect the data I got it. about what they're doing. And then they amalgamate that to make their report to whatever yes. city department guy gave you exactly. the money or whatever. And okay. it could be a state agency, you know, uh-huh. federal reporting is not like that. It's a little different because the mm. federal programs, the federal distributes low income housing tax dollars, but they're not, HUD is not looking at reporting in that way. Mm. They deputize states to look at those outcomes oh, okay. in order to receive. Well, kind of like the Section 8, right? They usually 
yeah, pass that off to a local to... agency to actually exactly. run the thing. Yeah. Housing authorities. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. So if someone wanted to donate to help new economics for women, how would they do that? Oh, is no. it individual donations or? Absolutely. I'll tell you recently, we had such an incredible thing. These ladies at, and I'll say their name, at Compato Yarn Shop um, <laughs> in Santa Monica. Okay, yes. Heard about what we do. And they got together and started knitting blankets for our youngest, our infants and our children. Oh my gosh. In La Posada building. They have created, I want to say, 40 blankets thus far for us to distribute. Wow. That kind of thing is phenomenal. We've had other individual donors. Our biggest donation to date was mm -hmm. a private donation from a family trust of $2 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. Wow. Game-changing yeah. donation. Dedicated. It's wow. earmarked for affordable housing. Wow. So we do things like that. So it runs yeah. the gamut, right? From the blankets, yeah. from the beautiful ladies who were knitting, yeah. to the family that identified new economics is where we want to put our family's trust money. Yeah. And we're going to dedicate that to find- Oh, that's a big responsibility money. too, right? It's one thing if it's the government. I mean, personally, I would feel more pressure if it's a family <laughs> foundation. These people chose you and want you to have their families. Life work, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> it was, I mean, for the family to have How made moving. that decision is incredible. And then there's a lot, there's other donors along the way. We have a, our next huge event will be a 5K run walk. Oh. This will be our fourth annual 5K. Oh, wow. Those are a lot of work to organize. It's on Mother's Day weekend. So it's oh, wow. Saturday before the Sunday Mother's Day. Oh, um, in May of 2020. Uh -huh. and it's going to be phenomenal. So we have a special category there. We have a category for adults with children in their, in their stroller. In a stroller. We had a first, second, and third prize winner. And dads participate too. Uh -huh. We're going to break it up this year so that the gentlemen and the ladies will have their own first, second, and third prizes in the stroller category. Well, encourage them to enter because the races I'm in, they're at the back because everyone's mad that they've got the stroller in the middle. These like average athletes that think they're like elite, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> well, we, we work with a wonderful partner that helps to produce the run. Okay. Athletics. And yes, the strollers go to the back, but we also run with kids. So we encourage families from all of our buildings, from our local residents, anybody, to bring wow. their children because it is a family friendly event. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was over a hundred um, child runners last year. So, wow, that's partners, awesome. The nonprofit that operates our charter schools, they have a running club. They brought their running club, and I think it's fourth and fifth graders. Um, wow, that's awesome. Great. The whole idea is to encourage families to get outdoors and yeah. engage in exercise. Mm -hmm. The stat that we heard was that. Among all of the run populations, so participants in 5Ks, 10Ks, and marathons, and even Ironman type stuff, uh -huh. the lowest rate of participation was among Latinas, right? Latina females. No kidding. And we thought, what is that about? I know. Well, that's, that's crazy. Because um, so I'm telling you, there's Latinas around here. that are always the winners in our race. So... <laughs> <laughs> Looking, that was a national aggregate of well, a stat. So what the heck, man? Yeah, that what makes no sense, around? right? And not only for that segment of our population, but for everybody to feel comfortable. The outdoor space is theirs. Right. It's a fun way to hang out with your kids and encourage that like kind of lifelong sensitivity to fun yeah. competition. Yeah, staying fit and the competition. Yeah. And, Sports yeah. is a big deal for me. I mean, I can tell you, having played soccer for 12 years, being on a team, being outdoors, and being able to compete taught yeah. me how to be a better lawyer, mm -hmm. a better mom, a better advocate, a better friend. Yeah. <laughs> because you Yeah, there's a know. lot of life lessons in sports. Yeah. yeah. So Especially I love Especially team it. sports, but yeah. yeah. To run, right? Yeah. It sensitized me to, I'm not afraid to be look sweaty. 
Mm-hmm. I think there's this notion that, oh, mm-hmm. you know, don't look at me because I've been working out. It's like, yeah. there's nothing more beautiful, you know? Why would we? Yeah, but the messy hair way? and the sweatiness. Why would, why would we have that weird social connotation that you're not as beautiful? Yeah, I don't have that. But like the younger generation definitely has this thing. I think because of social media, Instagram, everyone looks so perfect. Yeah. That if you don't look perfect, you're already not perfect. It's weird. Yeah. So, yeah, it. that's awesome. <laughs> We've done it three years in a row that five yeah. days, so that's coming. Especially because you mentioned the safe spaces earlier that walking to and from school feels dangerous to them. If they're in a crowd where exactly. it's joyful, it starts knocking that notion down, right? Exactly. So, that's a part oh, that's of That's an it. awesome thing. Yeah. Changing, yeah what a great idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then any other donations can be run through our website at www.neweconomicsforwomen.org. And okay. that would be another way of participating. Okay. We try and update that. And I think our Instagram is new econ for the number four women. Mm-hmm. I don't know the Facebook profile, but it's all. Yeah, it's all there. Well, very cool. Well, thanks yeah. for taking time with me today. I could talk for a whole nother hour about this. Thank you for everything you do. It sounds oh, like you're bringing you're so welcome. Much good information. I try you know, to all of us. I try to, I try to. So in those 2000 units, do you have an idea of the mix of what kind of housing it's going to be like? Is it a plan? to do so much affordable, so much for women. It's 100% homeless. affordable. I don't know how, what the... Or what community is. it's going to serve or whatever. Yeah, we don't know uh, yeah. that. We've got some ideas, but uh-huh. we don't know nothing that we sure. published yet. But we're looking at, we're trying to get the lowest area median incomes we can hit. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you where we're, we're seeing is really like a dearth of housing is workforce housing. Mm. Not only is it affordable housing, which is 120 AMI and under, but our teachers don't qualify at uh-huh. AMI. Our firefighters, our public servants, right? The school crossing guard doesn't qualify. So we're really looking at some workforce housing between mm. 120 and 150 area median income for our union members and for some of our skilled labor workforce. That's so they can I work close to home. Yeah, right. that's where we're going to go. This freeway business is becoming outrageous, so I don't know how people even do it. If you say, I'll suck it up and live in Palmdale because it's affordable, but then you're on the freeway three hours, right? So the quality of life is... It's such a sacrifice, right? Uh Um, I really see us looking at not only lower affordability, trying to serve at 30 to 120% AMI, Uh also really pushing the bounds to say our professional workers our union friends, those that teach our children deserve to also be our neighbors. Those right. that patrol our streets deserve to be our neighbors too. And that's between 120 and 150 AMI generally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are so few programs for that. And at that point, you're looking at people who are completely displaced and who would move out to other regions and then become lower class, kind of like lower income residents of these higher end places. It's an interesting and very difficult challenge. Mm -hmm. But I see us in our 2,000 units also looking to embrace workforce housing. Mm. Awesome. So I do have a question from one of our viewers. He says, if I was interested in doing low-income housing of my own, how would I reach out to make sure the demand slash vouchers exist before I start pursuing this type of investment? So how would they research whether or not the demand exists for the low-income housing unit? Yeah, how would I reach out to make sure the demand or vouchers exist? So I guess oh, okay. that there's people eligible before he starts building or right. converting the building well, to... Typically, we, every lender requires a market study. They can be between 5000 and $10,000, but there are groups that just churn out this work that can give you, based on demographic profiles, what is the market capacity of a certain area? What's the occupancy rate? Because that can tell you what's the absorption rate as people move in and out, not only for affordable, but for market developments. The voucher side is different. The voucher side, generally, there's an incredible lack of Section 8 housing, and that's what Mm -hmm. it would be. The local housing authority would be the place to start in whatever locality you're looking at. Mm. Um, and they often run programs kind of to sensitize developers or owners as to why it would be advantageous to work with a housing authority. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of two different things, but 
a market study would give the most robust answers, but we always go to a third party to be able to hire up to do that work. That's not a really community organizing thing. I mean, that's like a, it's a lending piece that you have Uh to have to move forward on financing. And so it has to be from a third party. Mm -hmm. I I could tell you all day, the rent's around here. (laughs) It won't be used for underwriting purposes. Right. So it's a part of your pre-development budget. You should go directly to the housing authority, the local housing authority to tell you what do you have to do. HUD rules are all going to be the same. Right. HUD rules for how you renovate a door, what is ADA compliance, how big does the kitchen have to be. That's going to be standard. That kind of stuff. But the administration of the vouchers, what's available, how do you apply. Yeah, that would be the housing authority that knows that. Yeah. So his question also is, aren't there limits to how much funding is available? So On the voucher side, that's just HUD's money and HUD has, I think, plenty of money. In fact, they complain, they complain that people don't come and ask for the vouchers or people who are eligible don't go. So I think that's priced still okay. Yes. Where there's a complete lack of vouchers is for the end user to get the voucher. That's where the wait lists are eight years. Where there is a total lack of housing stock is for these housing authorities to actually work with owners to Mm. designate something as Section 8. Right. My familiarity, I've never seen a housing authority say, oh, we have too much Section 8 here. Yeah, right. No, I I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that is a problem, but. Yeah. Well, I I do know, I talked to housing authority locally one time and they said, so you can convert an entire building to Section 8? Yes. That way they don't have to really apply or. It's the owner right. applying to be the Section 8 building correct. as That's opposed exactly to having it. onesie, twosie tenants that are That's Section correct. 8. The VA one also has that. You yes. can make it an entire VA building as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So hopefully that answered Keith's question or gave him some direction. So good. I'm glad it's like 3.59. So we've come to the end of our time. And I know someone wants their mommy home soon, I'm sure. <laughs> there she does. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble with that little one because oh, later so I meet them in the street and, you know, <laughs> last, night, so last night at my real estate class, I had a client from 20 years ago. Their son showed up. They didn't send him, but this guy goes, oh, my name's Giovanni. And I said, and he looked familiar and he goes, oh, I'm 25. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, so cool. Automatically it works out, but I was quite shocked. <laughs> Athena, look at you doing intergenerational knowledge. <laughs> We're going to call it that so I feel better. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Transfer. Yeah, I said, if I could force you to buy real estate, I would. So be careful sitting in that chair. <laughs> <That's so cool. laughs> so anyway, cool. awesome. thank you so much for joining me. Bye and guys. hopefully people will go to your website and... <laughs> oh, Keith says the real estate institution, Athena, the real estate institution. Uh, there you yeah, go. I agree. <laughs> so, you're, you're, you're. We're going to lock you up till you I own agree. something. <laughs> I agree. Thank you, Athena. <laughs> That's been you. awesome. Thanks to everyone and, out there. Yes. Thank you for joining me. So upcoming podcast to remind you guys, I have, oh, this is something similar. I have Frank Fuhrer, who's COO of Pad Split, and they are committed to solving the affordable housing crisis one room at a time and so they have shared rooms they're in atlanta and they also hope to be all over the u.s very soon so he's going to be on 1023 and then i have larry takahashi who's going to share with us all about reits and how they differ from regular real estate so that's it for our podcast in the next two weeks thank you so much again ali for joining us it was awesome and uh, thank you we'll be getting you this recording so for people who missed the live version they'll be able to hear you on the recorded version. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Athena. cool. Have Thank a great you. Weekend. You too. Have Thank a great so weekend. Bye bye. Bye. This has been another episode of My Cashflow Academy's Investors Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We wish you all the success you deserve as you use what you've learned here out in the real world. Check out the blog post for this episode, along with many more helpful resources at mycashflowacademy.com.